John Hoffman is the showrunner, co-creator, and writer of Only Murders in the Building. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. John, it's such a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I wanted to ask you right off the bat, when they approached you, Steve Martin and, and the team approached you with this idea, uh, what was it about true crime podcasts or the true crime genre that felt kind of inherently comedic or fertile for you know, a kind of murder mystery satire? Such a great question. Um, thanks for having me, David. It's so nice to be here. Um, that I, you know, I think the first thing that happened was Steve Martin had the idea. So I knew there was comedy gold in it somewhere. Um, and then meeting up with Dan and, and Dan Fogelman and Jess Rosenthal and, and Steve together, all of us uh, seemed a very quick like mind um, about the potential for it feeling new um, and, and in a way to sort of, you know, there's been so many murder mystery things for so long now. And, and I thought, uh, how do we take these two classic comedians, once we knew Martin Short was involved as well as Steve, it was like, okay, how do we make the classic meet modern? And we took that as a sort of mantra throughout the entire time uh, through casting Selena Gomez, a very modern young woman opposite these two legends. And, and sort of that kind of ethos permeated everything we did. Um, and I think ultimately the comedy was inspired uh, by many things, I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm, you don't live in a bubble. You, you, I, I watched, you know, all seven seasons of the Mary Tyler Moore show, uh, during the writing of this show. Um, it was on Hulu actually. Uh, it was perfectly timed for a pandemic and it calmed me down every night for two hour for two episodes every night in the midst of trying to write a first season of a television show under these amazing auspices. But, um, I think ultimately it was relying on the careers of all of them, uh, the ways in which they handled themselves comedically felt graceful to me, felt elegant, it felt New York. Um, and it also felt, oh, I want it to be a smart murder mystery. We all did. And how do we make that modern? And then it was sort of one of the early notions I shared with the group was that I thought, you know, that they could be making their own podcast as well as, as mutual true crime podcast fans. Uh, so that really was also the final sort of classic meets modern big picture uh, idea for the show. Yeah, speaking of the cast, uh, I did wanna ask, you've written some scripts before on Grace and Frankie, another legendary comedic duo, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. I um, only work I with Lily, that's all, I, I have a rule. Ridiculous. <laughs> Well, it's working out tremendously, I have to say. Oh my God, um, I don't know what star I fell under, yeah. But I did want to ask, was there anything from that experience writing for Jane and Lily to, you know, well, well established, but also who know each other and have worked together for so long that was helpful in writing a new series for Steve Martin and Martin Short, who are also not only legendary in their own right, but have collaborated for, for decades? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, no question. It was also, I'm sure it was why Dan and Jess, one of the reasons why they thought of me for this, you know, show running position, because it was, um, that experience was so seminal for me and, and working with Jane and Lily, but not just Jane and Lily. I mean, that was an incredible team to work with. And yes, there are, there are some parallels there uh, with sort of like a vibe, but I wanted to shake it up and be a little bit different. But the other thing from that experience was, um, the remarkable uh, experience of working with Marta Kaufman and, and Howard Morris on that show and, and sort of very experienced uh, showrunners that uh, sort of also I could watch and learn from and how they dealt with the stars. And then sort of as time went on, I was given more responsibility there and Jane and Lily became close friends now. And, and so that trajectory felt very akin to what hopefully would happen over here. And it happened very quickly with Steve and Marty as well. Um, and it, it, I hope it provided a bit of comfort for them um, as I joined up and they went, oh, okay, if you can do it with that, you know, some, some tie in felt nice. Yeah, and you mentioned a minute ago, uh, the wonderful Selena Gomez in the role. And I feel like one of the things that makes the show work is just the kismet chemistry between the three of them. It just feels so kind of faded um, to work so perfectly. Can you talk a bit about you know, what was the process of filling out that trio once you knew Steve and, and Martin were on board? And how did you kind of develop the character dynamics on set as you were, you know, were, you know rehearsing and, and working through the scripts? I love these questions, David. Yes. Um, 
the uh, this was the big thing, right? The sort of who is the third person here? And we had lots of discussions about it. Um, and it was Dan Fogelman that had that had the really inspired idea to sort of go, wait a minute, let's look completely in a completely different direction from what we might expect for this third person. And again, going back to that classic meets modern thing. So that that quickly centered around someone like Selena because I had known that she had been doing, you know, I had this ridiculous resume where I actually was an actor for years and, and um, I started out on the Disney Channel when I first landed in Los Angeles. So I recognized a kindred spirit in Selena immediately. And I knew like that was a great training ground. You learn how to be a pro very quickly. And more than that, what I saw in her was this sort of very natural style comedically that is very hers, just dry, witty, sharp, shrewd young woman. Um, and I thought, well, that's a different tone and contrasting lovely uh, potential with uh, Stephen Marty. So I, I immediately started to imagine that, but also she's gorgeous, she's cool. She's, uh, you know, everybody loves her. And I thought, well, let's talk to Selena Gomez. When we talked with her, then it was when she told us that she's actually a true crime nut and she had been to crime con with her mother like a year before that. And I was like, oh, okay. But the big question came when we, you know, we said, yes, Selena Gomez and Stephen Marty said, yes, we love her. And so it all happened very quickly there, but none of us had heard the three of them together, honestly, until two weeks before we started shooting. And we all got together on a Zoom and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is a cross your fingers moment. And I just, after that first table read Zoom, um, my phone just lit up with Steve, Marty, Dan, Jess, everybody calling and going, oh my God, did she come to play? And this is gonna work. And it, did you, we were howling throughout the whole thing. And just, they were so immediately kind of set on their heels in the perfect way by her. And she just has a very, like, she can't say a thing that isn't true and cuts right through the two of them. So I don't know, it just, that was magic. I can't take any credit for that. That's just three people coming together and being magical together. Well, one thing you can take some credit for is writing three, co-writing three of the scripts for the first season, uh, the first episode and the last two. And there's a great moment in the first episode where uh, Martin Short's character is complaining about the pacing of the podcast that they're all bonding over. You know, he wanted them to get to it more quickly. So I was wondering how much pressure were you all feeling to get the pacing of a murder mystery comedy right? Because I feel like it's such a tightrope of wanting to give away things as you go along and not drag it out, but just kind of get it just right. And I feel like the show, the pacing really does that um, quite superbly. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, this show is, um, pacing is huge for the show. And, and we're all very, very conscious of that. And you know, you, Two brilliant comedians know their pacing and they know the way they want it to read. So it's that kind of balance, but also just the show itself is tonally uh, a real, we took a real leap with it, you know, and it's balancing a lot of things. I've often said that the show is tonally New York. You know, you walk 10 blocks in New York and you're gonna find, you know, something that intrigues you, something that makes you roar laughing, something that, you know, scares you. And there's a Broadway show in the middle of the street promoting itself. And it's like, I wanted everything to be happening in this show like that, but the pacing for uh, what really was important to the show and connecting the audience to the characters was that human comedy at the center of it all and, and, and really recognizing three lonely people. Uh, that were isolated in their worlds. And I think in some way, I hope that made a, a sweet connection for our times uh, with people. And um, we had three actors that were very facile and could play, you know, the comedy as well as the, you know, internal stuff as well and, and, and really make you feel them. So all of those things have to be in balance and um, the writing for sure uh, from, everything about uh, we need to pace it up people to um, the, uh, you know, moments of connection that I think, you know, are really what the show is about all have to be sort of measured and metered out throughout each episode in a way. And, and it's, it may not be the most typical uh, comedy ever, but it's, it's got a lot of things happening all at once. 
Yeah, one of the things that really helps kind of structure the season are all of the cliffhangers and red herrings that are so kind of delicious as you're watching it unfold. I was wondering, how did you pick, as you were breaking the whole season in the room, how did you pick what characters would be really good antagonists or suspects and who to kind of zero, you know, home in on? Um, in, for example, that wonderful uh, boy, boy from 6B episode um, these kind of spotlight pieces where different characters take center stage. It's such, again, excellent question, David. The, um, it, it's thrilling because in the writing process with this brilliant team of writers I, I work with every day on this show, uh, we all, you know, I had a lot planned. We all had a lot planned structurally. We knew how the whole structure of the season would go. We knew the end moments of episode 10, and then we worked our way backwards. Um, and, and that mystery writing is very tricky. Uh, it wasn't something I was immediately akin to and finding those cliffhangers and red herrings and everything else, MacGuffins and everything, um, was the big challenge for this show. It's not a typical half hour comedy at all. It's, it's very complex. Um, but I think the process taught me uh, and the writers and, and working with the writers somewhere around the mid midpoint of like thinking episode four or five, it was starting to think like, oh, wait a minute, we have this podcast, we can change perspectives uh, through narration, as though this is pieces of the podcast potentially uh, that we're listening to. And more than that, as we got into episodes, you know, where Cindy Canning, Tina Fey is, is narrating, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're in another episode in Oscar is narrating, uh, and then Detective Williams, and then the Odemus. That became something that surprised me in the writing process because I realized, oh, we're making like a fabric of New York characters here. And, and that was exciting to me. Like I thought if we get from a point of view or a perspective in and we keep shifting it, we're still telling our central narrative, our central mystery story and creating comedic moments as well. We're just deepening the, hopefully the viewer's experience of the time and place we're in, New York, um, characters all around the way in which one death can affect um, so many lives. And that was really intriguing to me and just made it feel bigger. Yeah, speaking of New York, aside from the beautiful Arconia that I'm sure everybody is envious of those who <laughs> live there, the, the beautiful apartments, what helps this show for me feel so New York is the incredible wealth of theater actors that you have um, in large and small roles. Nathan Lane, Jane Howdy Shell, Jackie Hoffman, Adrian Lennox. I mean, I could go on and you know on and on. Um, so can you just talk about the the kind of theatricality of the show itself and also the wonderful way that you kind of spoof uh, Broadway and musical theater with Martin Short's character. Oh, I, this makes me so happy to talk about. I, I'm this person. I, I grew up in the theater. I was went to school in New York. I came to New York. I knew a lot of directors like Marty who lived in apartments like Marty, maybe a little smaller, um, but lived like Marty did. Um, and I very much always, I honestly tell you honestly, David, that like for the last 10 to 15 years, I've been saying out loud, boy, wouldn't it be a dream to make a show in New York? Because I always had a thought about that. Um, and, a, and a feeling about that, like a, a desire to sort of share a New York, a romantic New York, a, a exciting, interesting, odd New York. Um, and here we are, and, and I feel incredibly lucky, but it's also um, sort of born out of all the things that, all of that stuff is in my bones, kind of, uh, just the experience of the theatricality of it all. Um, and I thought, you know, again, it's, it's, the, it's the leaps that, we were taking with the show, you know, Marty's interrogation on stage uh, with, with the lineup. Uh, you know, these were things that I pitched early on at Hulu and I thought, oh my God, that guy kicked me out of the room here with this one. Um, and they were like, go, go, go. So those moments just were thrilling. But then, I mean, we had the mixed blessing, right? Of, of during when we were shooting it, that there was a lot of people available uh, to work. And, but the great, amazing part was they all said yes you know they'll come out of their homes it was a scary time but they were coming for Steve and Marty they were coming for Selena they were coming for work and connection again and so I can't believe it now some of the people that we had in there are good friends of mine Jane Howdy Shell I worked with years ago I adore her I love that you mention her Nathan is a dream of mine to work with you know and and boy was he spectacular here but then the surprise is uh, Jackie Hop. I mean, the name them. They they go on and on and on. And Amy Ryan. I mean, it's 
it's these are all people that are sort of of like mind and came with the same spirit. So the energy around the set was crazy uh, and, and very emotional in certain ways. Um, and I hope, you know, and it's looking good for, uh, I'll give them a little spoiler for season two, that even though times have changed and people are working a lot more, which is wonderful, um, it's, it's been very sweet to have uh, yeses from, from a lot of the people uh, who want to come back and, and, and want to still be a part of the building. Yeah, it is incredible that theater actors can manage to find time before a night performance or in between, you know, <laughs> matinee and evening performances to do um, a series, which is very exciting for, you know, theater buffs at home who, who are watching. Um, you mentioned Amy Ryan, and I do have to ask you about the finale. So if people haven't seen the show yet, you know, mute your, mute your computer for this question um, and, and get, you know, watch it right now, finish, finish the season. Um, but I just have to ask you about that finale scene, the kind of, um, you know, interrogation between Steve Martin and, and Amy Ryan, their characters, and you don't quite know who has the upper hand. It's such a kind of wonderful and surprising reveal of this kind of season long mystery. How fun was it just to write that and kind of choreograph these different moves because it the kind of power dynamic shifts so many times in that really exciting scene. Thank you for mentioning that. I, I, I've rarely had as a better time writing anything. Um, it was all because of, you know, and a lot of it was inspired by, you know, the great work that sort of the writers had done to sort of tee up everything. But it's a scene I've been thinking about for a long time, you know, that cat and mouse between them. Um, and more than that, it was also, you've had these incredible actors and, and how to give them something that feels like really complicated in a short period of time, we're a half hour comedy, um, but to really like let it unspool in a way that could be surprising. As you say, I'm glad to hear that um, so much due to those performances. And also I will say the, the thrill for me was fulfilling in a certain way in that final episode, the brilliance of Steve Martin and um, or aiming there. Uh, he had, we were purposefully setting him up to be so love struck in the previous episodes so that he was a little bit fading. And I very, very much wanted to see that incredibly intelligent man step forward that experienced, as he calls himself, a true crime aficionado, step up in that moment when we think he might not. And um, it's just one of my great favorite uh, moments is when he's talking about um, I'm taking stage sips um, and it all turns and then it turns again and then it turns again and then it we get the ultimate lift of um, the back half of the episode and his pure genius physical comedy and and all of it in one episode to me uh, I'm such an admirer of his of everyone in this cast to see what Marty did through across the season as well but to see what Steve did in that final episode, just, just, uh, and, and to hear him very sweetly, if you get a little bit of something like, I think that worked, <laughs> um, you're, that's all I want. Uh, you know, that's the other thing, the joy of this whole process has been feeling them be happy with, with how it's gone. And, uh, you know, there was a big burden at the beginning of this thing that um, felt lifted. And of course, now there's a season two, so it's all back on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, two, um, two quick questions before I let you go. First, uh, you have a great kind of fun and unexpected celebrity cameo from Sting playing himself in the first season. Uh, I'm wondering who would be your dream tenant at the Arconia? If you could pick anybody, any real person, musician, actor, you know, writer, who would your dream tenant at the Arconia be? I will say, David, hang tight. They're on the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that answers my last question, which is you've been very generous um, with teasers for I'm season going. two. Um, are there any other teasers you can give us for season two as we're eagerly awaiting um, the new episodes? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. It goes, it, you know, it continues to get a little bigger. They really stepped in it at the end of episode one, uh, season one. And, um, it, I would say this, you know, the, again, particular to New York, um, there's famous and then there's New York famous. 
and they have stepped into New York famous. Uh, and there's two sides of that. And both may be okay to step into, but both maybe not be okay to step into. And it, and it, and it's going to be a real sort of challenge for them to hold together uh, throughout that. John Hoffman, congratulations on the first season of Only Murders in the Building. And thanks so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you so much, David.